mode. Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, as we all are, or good morning if you're on the West Coast, or if you're around the world, whatever time it is. We were just chit-chatting about what time it might be in Australia right now. Welcome to the Serving Leader webinar with Dr. Ken Jennings and John Stalwart. And we're so thrilled to have this hour to invest with you learning about a serving leader and some powerful actions that can transform your team and community. I want to take a minute for you to get familiar with the GoToWebinar technology, and we're going to be using the question panel for some question and answers at the end of this event. And so I invite you right now to tell me in your question and answer panel. I'm really curious, is there anyone on this webinar who has not attended one of my webinars in the past? If so, tell me. Um, we'd also love to know where you're calling in from. I understand, Ken, that you are not at home. You're doing some work with Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. Is that correct? It's a lot warmer here than Pittsburgh usually is. Um, and John, where are you today? I'm sitting in my library on the second floor of my house in Pittsburgh. Awesome. And I'm calling in today from my office here in Lambertville, Michigan. And Linda is new on our webinar today. Linda, welcome. We're really thrilled to have you. So a couple of other um, ideas for today's webinar. We are going to invite you to live tweet during this event and when we move to the next slides you're going to see a hashtag for today's event. We welcome you if you enjoy Twitter to share your thoughts. It looks to me like we have a lot of Pennsylvania people on this call um, and we have at least one person calling in from Nebraska where there's a blizzard that has happened. We have a first timer from Argentina. Wow those comments are coming in so fast. Welcome, Marcy, in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm not going to be able to acknowledge everyone, but we are so thrilled that you are investing your time with us today. Um, we're going to do today's webinar in a Q&A fashion, so I'll be having a great conversation with Ken and John. And then toward the end of the call, we're also going to invite your questions so you can join the conversation with us. I'm going to encourage you to stay on until the very end. This week, we are celebrating the launch of the 10th anniversary edition of this book, the Serving Leader, uh, John and Ken's book that they co-authored together. And I do have some copies of this book that I'll give away, but you have to stay on until the very end to find out how. So that's only fair, right? You see, I have a bunch of copies behind me. Um, and so, as I said, we're going to jump right into the content in just a few minutes. And first, I want to take the chance to introduce these two amazing gentlemen to you. First, Ken Jennings is a best-selling author. He's a speaker and an active consultant in, the le in leadership development. He's also the founder of Third Rivers Rivers, excuse me, Partners. So Ken counsels senior leadership teams at many healthcare technology pharmaceutical and biotech organizations, and he's worked with such amazing organizations as the Cleveland Clinic, John, Johns Hopkins University, Texas Health Resources, and other organizations. And I imagine we might hear some stories from your work in today's call. Is that true, Ken? Absolutely. Welcome, Ken. Um, I would also love to introduce John Stalwart. Dr. John Stalwart is a best-selling author an internationally known speaker, and an expert in growing leaders. I also happen to know, uh, because I'm friends with John on Facebook, that he's also an amazing dad and grandpa. Um, Ken, I imagine you're the same, but I haven't had that same exposure to your family. John right now serves as the president of Newton Institute and director and directs its Center for Serving Leadership. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And Great pleasure. So I do have one quick uh, housekeeping item. Is there a way to see the open chat of others? So it's not possible to see people's questions in the question panel, but if you'd like to interact live, we invite you to go to Twitter to follow the hashtag, or there is a chat panel that you can also use. I'm going to primarily focus on the question panel and serving all of you today during this event. All right, so let's jump into this content. We have a lot to cover. Uh, Ken, I'm going to ask you first to introduce to us these five practices that we're going to be learning about together today. So these, uh, these were pretty interesting to discover with John and I. Uh, first, we looked at effective leaders and could look around them to say, what were the actual behaviors of the most effective leaders? Uh, they were just uh, vibrating with uh, good. And the practices that uh, fell out of that were the five that we write about in the book. And we'll talk more deeply about it, each five. Uh, the first one was running to a greater purpose. Every uh, great leader inviting people to be part of a cause, not just join a company. Upending the pyramid had to do with getting ego out of the way, so to make room for others to be uh, excellent and have ideas. Building on strength 
We saw leaders as uh, strength spotters in encouraging the development of teams that lived out their strengths, raising the bar of expectations having to do with, as we know, you get what you expect from people. So great leaders were setting those expectations every day in every way in a high with a high bar. And then blazing the trail uh, was our depiction of making it possible for people to perform by removing barriers. These are the five competencies, clusters, behaviors of what you would actually see people doing. Hence the title, the serving leader. We wanted to put the ING on this thing uh, to say what we actually see people do in terms of serving. Thanks, Ken. Well, let's dig in deeper to that first action. And John, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean when you talk about running with great purpose? So uh, following right on uh, behind what Ken was saying about those leadership behaviors that we observe every time we're in an organization or a company that has amazing uh, energy and results in their sector, um, one of the things these leaders are doing is intentionally and uh, very behaviorally paying attention to helping their people understand the purposefulness of work. It turns out uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to observe this, but many people miss it. Workers require meaning in order to bring their A game. You can get a certain amount of uh, compliance and performance from a paycheck or from management uh, incentives or even from, you know, carrots and sticks. But if you want brilliance uh, and imagination and honor and people going the second mile uh, and doing their utmost, which, by the way, is what differentiates a great organization from just a good one, uh, then you need to do certain things that win the hearts and minds of their people. And one of those is you need to help your people understand why their work counts in the world. Uh, beyond paycheck. I'll give you an example. I've had the pleasure over the years of working with the Industrial Scientific Corporation, which is a manufacturer leading in the world of gas detection safety equipment. And uh, they have workers bent over circuit boards and packing boxes and doing lots of things that workers do. But their vision statement, their great purpose statement, is that industrial scientific workers are dedicating their careers to eliminating death on the job in this century. And they teach their workers on purpose, intentionally built into everything they talk about, to think about, would it be all right while I'm manufacturing this gas detection implement if my father's life depended on it? Am I satisfied with what I'm doing right now if it were my own dad? And that's just one example of many that Ken and I have encountered over the years of great companies going to great lengths to help their people understand deeply meaningful, purposeful reasons why their work makes a difference to others in the world. It's very important that we do that as leaders for our people. Ken, do you have any examples on that uh, end to share? I love, I love the one John just gave. Um, an organization I uh, got to work with for a number of years was the Cleveland Clinic, and they, they've been number one in heart for 20 years plus. And if you're a physician there, the CEO used to say uh, to me, Toby Cosgrove, it's good to be king if you're a doc here. But everyone else was less than engaged. And so they started a process. They embraced the book as a way of reinventing how they led at the clinic. And they uh, socialized a, a, uh, a phrase that goes with this, and it was, uh, we're all caregivers here, all of us, whether you're a parking lot attendant or a, a, a scrub nurse or a physician. At first, the docs were kind of opposed to saying, we're all caregivers here. After all, we're the caregivers. But over time, it, it caught fire. So everyone developed a pride in, I'm a caregiver. I can care for a family when they come in the front door that looks lost and troubled. And I... You know, I love this. Um, John mentioned a dad. I was I finished a, a session at the Cleveland Clinic, and I was driving back to Pittsburgh where I live, and the phone rang, my cell phone. And my own father had been involved in a car accident. And uh, he hung on for 11 days in an ICU. And it was a tough process. But uh, 
I now know with just a simple Band-Aid made by J&J, &J, they could have monitored his heart every day and told him today wasn't his day to drive. So I've become passionate myself about telemedicine. There's a power that's personal and business for being able to, being able to connect what you do every day to the greater purpose of organizations. We all have these stories. John and I could tell a hundred from our clients, but I hope while you're listening, you're starting to write down, how do I connect my greater purpose to the purpose of my company? That'd be a good takeaway from this particular action. Sure, and I love that question on the slide. As a leader, how will you ignite greater purpose? John? Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that we encounter is that uh, leaders in certain industries, uh, not making gas detection, you know, life-saving equipment or not being uh, medical personnel, but doing things that might be considered more quote-unquote mundane, uh, sometimes say that you know, there's nothing really that we can offer our people here in the purpose space. And the fact of the matter is that we are obligated as leaders to do the hard work of thinking through for our people and then communicating again and again with a lot of passion and enthusiasm this purpose matter. Uh, you know, leadership is hard work, and sometimes it's hard ourselves to imagine the great purpose. But let me give you an example um, uh, on the other side of the um, uh, of the uh, food chain, if if I may uh, make a, a, a kind of a joke here, Chick Fil A uh, food, chicken. Their workers show up with purpose, and um, I've worked with people who say, "Well, fast food is fast food, and you can't ignite purpose in fast food." Let me tell you what Truett Cathy, the founder, uh, the late beautiful Truett Cathy, used to say, and think about this in the light of fast food. He said. I imagine in every encounter that I have with another human being, however brief, that in that encounter I have the opportunity to change the trajectory of that person's life forever. And they've taken that and they've instilled that into how do you imagine that mom driving up to the drive through window or that harried, you know, uh, worn out worker at the end of the day coming up to the counter. And so purpose can be brought to every kind of work. And Ken and I believe this deeply, and uh, we've seen uh, beautiful leaders who do this work very intentionally. We can't do vision once a year or once a company and then put it on the shelf. We have to tell the stories and remind our people and build it into what we, what we talk about day by day and week by week so that our people have a sense of why it matters that they should get out of bed in the morning and go and serve in their workplace. Thanks, John. So, Ken, moving on to the next practice, can you explain how great leaders upend the pyramid? Well, this action has to do with uh, uh, what we see great leaders doing again, of getting their own egos out of the way, turning the pyramid of power, where it used to be in many organizations in a hierarchy, I'm in charge and are you lucky you're down further in the pyramid, to turning that upside down. And great leaders now envision themselves at the bottom of a pyramid, empowering those above them. I've even seen organizational charts now written with the upside-down pyramid. The idea here is to keep my ego in check, hold my breath during a meeting, and let others have ideas and direction. And uh, deferring, encouraging those around you focusing on mutual learning and shared understanding around a problem before taking action, looking to delegate in order to empower, and build interdependent relationships outside of the hierarchy so people uh, work with together with each other across the room. I would say also uh, dipping into the research on this, the research is pretty profound. Since we wrote the book over a, a decade ago, if you would have invested in companies with this kind of leadership style, you would have outperformed the standard and fours uh, index by an order of magnitude. If you can spot companies that have personally humble, uh, high intention leaders at the center, you do well. So what John and I have done is to turn these good intentions to lead differently into tools and practical approaches. Uh, there's a whole community now uh, building these kinds of tools 
to help leaders lead differently. But I guess I would say, how, how long can you hold your breath in a meeting and let others have some oxygen <coughs> to have the good ideas? Anything to add, John, about upending the pyramid? Well, you know, Ken, Ken Blanchard uh, often uses his hands and, and he says, you know, the pyramid is right side up for vision and values. Uh, we, don't, we don't hand the organization over uh, for everybody to do whatever they want. And so leadership has a, has a position to make sure that purposefulness is there and values are adhered to and people don't cut standards. But then he always says, that, and then the pyramid flips. Uh, so that we can get down underneath our people and help them to become more. Uh, I work with a, a, a great number of first-generation entrepreneurs. Um, in, in cohort work I do, I often have a, a 40 or 50 or 60-year-old founder of a company that's now maybe a $5 million company or a $300 million company, but they haven't upended the pyramid, and, and, and it becomes a crisis. Because as they hit 50 or 55 or 60, they realize they can't leave. Everything that they know, everything that they do, all the ways in which they bring value to their company, they kept doing themselves and putting people around them to do the other stuff. But they never grew their people. They never invested in their people to learn what it is that makes this company great from the standpoint of the leadership level. They didn't up into pyramid. And then they get into, into this catch-22 where uh, they feel like they can never retire or they just have to kind of walk away and watch it implode. And that is absolutely unnecessary. We invest in our people so that what we do today, they can do tomorrow. And, uh, and that frees us. We can get up and out instead of getting drugged back down and in uh, on the stuff that people aren't handling right. We can get up and out because our people have become more and then that frees us to bring value back at a higher level. And it's very exciting to watch leaders get this and then begin to upend the pyramid and grow their organization's capacity to grow. I love that, John, especially as an entrepreneur myself, to really think about that. So any final thoughts on that point, Ken? Yeah, well, Becky, we had you in mind with this action. You're right. Uh, so, I definitely uh, need to upend the pyramid. <laughs> So t two very quick practical things. Uh, one is uh, literally structuring your meetings differently so that you have each person have time to speak uninterrupted because we usually play ping pong. And then having a timekeeper. Uh, the literal structuring with a tool of running meetings differently. Uh, the last would be an example. I've uh, been working with a company called Fresenius. Uh, kidney care, uh, dialysis, 60,000 folks, 2,200 operating locations. And we were all excited as consultants to roll this out to 60,000 people. That's like the consultant's dream, right? And uh, Bill Valley got into it, the CEO, and he said, uh, now that I understand this a little more, I'm going to be selfish. We're going to up in the pyramid here. We're going to start with my team for the first year. And we spent an entire year just with Bill and his senior team so they learn how to do this, run meetings differently, keep their ego in check before the second year we started reaching out to the rest of the organization. I cringed when he said it, but it was a beautiful decision on his point. So he could say, do as I'm trying to do, not as I say. So the example becomes really important there. You bet. All right. Well, let's take a look at that next practice, raising the bar. So, John, can you help us understand what raising the bar means in the context of a serving leader? Well, I love Ken's uh, story just now about setting standards from the top. He told that story in the context of up in the pyramid. If we, if we want our culture to take on the, the characteristics and qualities and standards that we speak of, then we have to do it from the top. And, and what... what um, the company Ken was referring to did is the only way that we drive these things through. And it's true, just the same in Raise the Bar. Here, we're working at uh, instilling, not just in our talk, but in our practices, the, the values that establish the culture that holds the standards of our organization. You know, there's an old saying that, uh, val that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. We know the failure rate of, uh, of the execution of strategic plans because we never take into consideration after we've made our plan 
and budget our money and staffed our teams that we have to make sure the culture is prepared uh, to be able to sustain uh, the uh, the work that's involved to get that done. And so in Raise the Bar, we, we work at that gap between strategy and execution, not to close it, because strategy and execution never closes, but to bridge it, to build strong bridges from strategy to execution in the culture space. Um, an example I, I use uh, in this is I, I work with a German um, uh, manufacturer, again, at uh, this time of mu municipal pumping um, capability. And what we did inside um, uh, Prominent Fluid Controls, this is a company out of Heidelberg that, that has uh, locations around the world, is we took their values, which they had clarified, uh, they knew what they were, they, they had written them out or they had talked them through, but we, uh, we embedded them. We went through a process of, of, first of all, making sure everybody understood what the leaders uh, at Prominent believed those values meant. But then we went through a step-by-step -step stage gating process until we had every single employee, um, you know, the forklift operators and the people out of chipping and receiving and the people who were crating up the, uh, the implements, every single one of them went through a series of examples of telling stories on each other of great examples of living out the values. It's very powerful to gather your teams around tables and, and require them to remember positive examples of when Bobby lifted up the value of integrity concretely. So you can, you can build a library of bragging rights around your own people living the values out. And then we had each person make a values um, um, promise where they, in their own language and in their own terms, um, came up with ways they're going to live that out. <laughs> and doing this so that the values leave the leader, get a cascade through the organization, is essential and very powerful in the work that we do in Raise the Bar. So just a couple of, a couple of housekeeping things. Becky, when you type, it's pretty loud on this system. And I'm I sorry about that, Ken. I normally have a tech person. We have somebody having some audio issues here that I was trying to help, so I apologize. No, no worries. And John, you're warbling a little like we're losing signal uh, just a little bit. So um, I would just say a couple of very quick practical things under Raise the Bar. John painted it uh, rightly. On the slide, we, we, we said leader development and goal attainment can happen together. I've become a big believer in uh, this training and development space that leaders are best developed under the pressure of real projects with feedback. So putting leaders in an action learning uh, environment. And uh, I had one leader who, in a cohort, uh, everyone said would be the new CEO. But halfway through our project, when we did some voting on uh, leadership characteristics that were being developed here and trying to raise the bar, she came out dead last by vote of her teammates. But with that feedback, while working on real projects, she said, I'm going to try turn this around, and I'll, I'll win you all over, and she did. The payback, when you blend going after real project breakthroughs with the development of leaders, is at least 10 to 1, and $10 for every dollar you invest. So when we're raising the bar here, it isn't just behaving differently, it's do you behave differently in order to help achieve an outcome, a project. So I, I like this idea now of uh, as John certainly has pioneered in many ways with cohorts, of doing real project work while you're also working on your leadership skills so we can give each other feedback on how we're doing, living out uh, the values and behaviors of a, of a serving leader. That's the payback. Not necessarily the classroom training, that's important, but putting people into real projects. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about trailblazing. So the book outlines teaching and removing obstacles so that others can follow the path. Can you tell me more about that? Well, this, uh, the slide that's up is Peter Drucker, who's now deceased, but he lived well into his 90s and still owns the record for most Harvard Business Review articles. I spent the day in Peter's home before he passed away, and I asked him a question. I had a good client with me. Uh, 
I asked a question trying to show off a little bit, and I said, Dr. Drucker, how, do, how does my client, how does an organization attract the best people? And he said in this great Austrian voice, Ken, Ken, this tells me how little you know. And uh, I had to smile because he wrote the article about it isn't about attracting the best talent necessarily. It's about blazing the trail, breaking through barriers so all the rest of us can achieve. And this has to do, the quote we put up here is that sometimes we mistakenly define management as making it difficult with new rules for people to get things done. Uh, the idea here is that great serving leaders spot the barriers and obstacles that stand in the way of people's performance and they bust through them. One organization took all of their HR policies that mostly said what not to do and it just made people profound unable to act, they publicly burned the policies in the courtyard to say, you should the common sense that God gave you, and if you do three times in a row, somebody's going to come and talk to you, but we want to get rid of those barriers to innovation and good work. That's what this action really is about. We see executives getting out of their office so they can see what stands in the way of others performing. Uh, I know John has some very practical perspectives on this one. Uh, what, what would you add to this one on Blazer Trail, John? Well, what, I, I love what you shared, and um, uh, I think it was Bob Buford um, uh, who brought uh, Drucker into our circle about uh, a dozen years ago. You took me back to a very uh, wonderful uh, encounter, Ken, with your story. And uh, um, what we've done in, in Blaze the Trail, in our cohort work, is we've asked the question, uh, and the tools we've built, we've asked the question, uh, what did the Trailblazer do uh, that brought success? And so we do, a, um, uh, we do an analysis of what the, what the real value proposition is of the enterprise that we're serving. Oftentimes, uh, people get confused about where their value lies. And you know the old saying that, we get 80% of our results from 20% 20, 20 of our labor, and our companies do as well. And we can get diverted and, and distracted into doing multiple things that uh, you have to stop and say, why are we doing that? And what if we took the energy that we're pouring into that rabbit trail and pulled it back into the center space of our value creation? And so we, we look at, through some examination tools, through the eyes of our customers, what is our value proposition? What did the trailblazer who brought this um, this company to life do that attracted customers and caused the marketplace to say, I want to spend my money there because of you know A, B, or C? And then uh, we, we develop a teaching uh, methodology. You know, leaders need to become teachers. And so we go through a very detailed uh, teacher planner and coaching planner. Uh, a lot of leaders don't understand we have some learning to do about how to do this well. I know how to do it. How do I turn that into a plan to teach you how to do it? We have to get very concrete and specific about these things to help leaders get out of themselves what they're great at and down into their people those same things. And then we do the, 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 you know, the obstacle removing. Now that we're clear that our value proposition is here and this stuff is in the way, let's get rid of it. So our people can can run fast on the path of value creation and contribution. Uh, it's great fun work, very exciting work to see people get clear about what they sort of know. But you know we get lost in the um, in the fog of ourselves, and it's a, it's a terribly helpful each of us to have uh, someone help to sort that out, so that uh, we can sort out where the trail is, clean that trail up, blaze it, get the rocks off the trail, so we can run fast. Could you connect that to the big idea of the serving leader? Uh, well, let me, yeah. Uh, so back to where Ken started at the very beginning. You know, everything that we teach in, in Run to Great Purpose and, and um, in Up in the Pyramid and Raise the Bar and Blaze the Trail, and in a moment we're going to talk about uh, Build on Strength, is built on the understanding that our, our people are the difference makers. Um, yes, we and leaders do a lot of things, but if our people don't show up big, it doesn't matter how smart we are and how much money we have and, and what our marketing plan is, if our people don't show up, 
then we're not going to get results. And at the heart of the serving leader is, um, it, it seems silly to even say this, but is the understanding that we leaders are not in leadership for ourselves. We're just not. Uh, and we know the train wreck of leaders who think they are. And so they're not watching for the growth of people and they're not watching uh, the well-being of their company. And their eye isn't on the customer. Uh, their eye is on themselves. And um, whatever is their problem, ego or, or greed or whatever that is, we know some leaders like that. Uh, conversely, when Ken and I go around the world and, <clears throat> and meet leaders of extraordinary companies, and they are countless uh, beautiful companies, we see leaders who remember that they are leading to serve. Uh, they're in the world to serve. They're in the world to serve customers. They're in the world to serve people. They're in the world to serve values and standards. They're not there for themselves. And so the serving leader simply is a way for Ken and I to remind us and everybody, your job is to reorient yourself to your job. And uh, by the way, the interesting thing, the data, the research, and all of the uh, anecdotal reality is that leaders who are serving leaders get better results. And so, uh, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's self-interest that drives us. We should become serving leaders because we're going to we're going to get better results if we get our eye off ourselves and on to the value creation and the world serving purposes that our organizations hold. Thanks. Ken, do you have some thoughts on this? Well, I'm going to be very quick. I think we're uh, uh, John's painted the perspective. Uh, I'll just talk to some of the practical ways this works. Uh, when you do organizational surveys, as many of you do, uh, add those questions that say, what are the things that stand in the way of you performing? Don't pretend that you know what they are. And you'll hear things like, uh, I don't know how to do my job well, training. Uh, they'll talk about physical proximity. I'm too far away from my colleagues. Uh, then redesign the office. Survey for the practical things and do something about it. In a large clinical setting, we simply took one clinical area, orthopedic surgery, and identified sy systematically the barriers that stood in the way of safe surgery and the flow. And we invited everyone, not just the docs, the nurses, the lo logisticians. When we identified those, we eliminated them. And they had better flow through. That meant seeing more patients. The quality went off, off the charts, because there were fewer things that could screw up. And that we didn't have to try to sell this to the rest of the 220 operating rooms in this large place. The reputation, what was going on, spoke for itself. So everyone, everyone wanted in on this. Uh, the last thing I would say, and John pointed this out, this is personal to you as a leader. Uh, more than half of your day, if you really want to be serving, this blaze the trail one is the one that I look for. Are you really helping others, enabling them, giving them a clear running path to success? And then as they succeed, give them the feedback. Thank you. Say, do more of that. Uh, that's what a serving leader does, uh, relentlessly breaks through the barrier here and then points out where people have succeeded. Thanks. Well, let's take a look at that fifth practice. So many people talk about building on our weaknesses, but you talk about building on strengths for breakthroughs. So let's let's talk about that together. What does that look like? Well, there's so many um, great voices in this space um, that, that Ken and I have benefited from. Uh, a couple of data points. Uh, one is that when we invest in getting better at the things we're best at, we grow faster. And, uh, for example, if I'm really bad with details, uh, I could pour a lifetime of investment into getting better at details, but I'm not going to get much uh, return on that investment. I, I may be able to get a, a failing grade to, uh, uh, to the, the grade of a C-, minus, but it's not going to be fantastic. The, the truth of the matter is that there, there just are very few, I almost want to say no, well-rounded leaders. I think there are some well-rounded leaders, but there are very few well-rounded leaders. And when we start out, we think we have to know it all and do it all. I was working with the young president of a 
of a medical technology company here in, in my city in Pittsburgh. And he tells a beautiful story on one of our training videos of believing that he had to be the everything CEO because he didn't know that um, we have strengths and weaknesses. And he had never done any assessments. And of course, uh, you know, with a grin on his face, he said, you know, I was, I was just lying. I was just hiding the reality. Everybody else knew I wasn't good at this stuff that, that I was uh, pretending to be good at. Um, but then by learning, I'm good at this. I'm a CEO with a strong business development capacity, or I'm a, I'm a leader who's great at strategy, or, or whatever the mix is for you. Then we can begin to do assessment around other people's strengths, and we can put strengths together. Um, there are no well-rounded leaders, or a few of them. There can be very well-rounded leadership teams where we bring strength to strength uh, and put those things together in a concrete way. And so we use assessments, uh, and, and we, we encourage a very uh, open display of those assessments, particularly when they're work-style assessments, so that uh, our people can come to recognize one another's strengths and draw on each other. Um, I, I see increasingly, and I know Ken does uh, as well, companies that post strengths, uh, even outside office doors, so that uh, colleagues can pull on one another and say, you know, this is something you're good at. We have a quick project. Can I ask you a question? That speeds up uh, so many things inside a company. When, when we get strengths visible, when we build on strengths, and we let people square their shoulders for the good of the team in those places where their shoulders are broadest. I love that idea of posting the strengths outside of the door. Ken? So I, um, again, John's painted it very well. Um, I think many of our friends are using uh, the Gallup work on Strength Finder. Uh, we use it over and over again. It's great research. So uh, I would encourage you to use any of the Gallup Strength Finder work if you haven't done it. I'll also warn you that at Center for Creative Leadership has done good research on this. A strength taken to an excess is, by definition, a weakness. So I, if I'm confident but taken to an excess, I can appear arrogant. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the composition of a senior leadership team is a tricky thing. Uh, but a mis classic mistake is to hire people that look like you, makes you comfortable. I like to tell CEOs, uh, your team should be heterogeneous. They, sh they should look different from you. In fact, they should be different enough in perspective and strengths that every day they irritate you. So if your team isn't, if team isn't ir irritating you, you probably, has it, you, you probably have it wrong. And I'm, I'm happy to see that many organizations are redoing their talent management an annual appraisal process to get away from strengths and weaknesses, to so work on your weaknesses. Everybody knows they're called weaknesses for a reason. You're not good at it, and you never yeah. will be. Uh, so stop, <laughs> stop doing it. Get the complementary strength. The idea, instead of uh, focus on getting better at your weaknesses, is let's be clearer about the shared goals that you and your teammates are going after raise the bar on that, build on strength, run to the greater purpose. I'm seeing that many organizations, my old alma mater, Accenture, has done away with the annual appraisal. Instead, they're going after uh, collective goals. And that's very consistent with the serving leader building on strength. Uh, we didn't build, uh, we didn't write all the strength-based stuff at Gallup, but uh, it sure came along in the last 10 years just, just in time. I'd, I'd also point out a couple of other books. If you haven't read the, I bet you've read this one, John, The Boys in the Boat. Great. Uh, it's about uh, in the 1930s, those who went to the Olympics, a bunch of blue-collar kids that worked together strength on strength. Go read it. You know, building on strength. This occurred to me the first week or so I was at the Air Force Academy. Um, we were presented with an obstacle with six-floor building with no uh, walls or ladders, and you had to get a four-person team to the top of it. No way to do it. And uh, we had one young kid, I'll never forget him, Carl Dundor, world-class gymnast. He said, I think I can jump to the first floor, and then I can reach down and pull all of you up. That was his strength. And we did that for six floors until we're all hanging up in space on the fifth floor, 
spotted his strength. The rest of us had the strength of hanging on and built on that all all the way up. So I love this action because it says you don't have to be Superman, but as John said, you build a well-rounded team. And, and you know, the, you talk, Ken, uh, it's such a great comment to remind us that a strength taken to extremity becomes gross. I think about, right. um, well, I won't give examples of it because I, I don't want to offend anybody, but we can take things to a ridiculous say, level. Politics, weren't you? No, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but by the same token, strengths work can be done in a way that's overdone. And, um, you know, we don't, uh, the, the caution here uh, that, that Ken and I feel very deeply about is we don't do strengths work to put people in boxes. And so, uh, you know, do, do strengths finder with Gallup, do disc uh, standout work that Marcus Buckingham did, the Colby. Uh, these are all good. Uh, and there are others, uh, PI, you know, the predictive index. What we don't want is to just box people up and say, okay, I know who you are, because that becomes almost contrary. No, it becomes contrary to um, what we're talking about here. And, and so an attending strength, if you will, to building on strengths is to pay attention and to listen more deeply. It's interesting to me that um, – that we actually do develop some new strengths. You know, life puts us into crucibles and things come out of us that we didn't know were there. And if we had gotten boxed at 30 or 40 in a certain way, we'd miss things. And uh, I, I like to watch uh, as CEOs build, um, you know, certain kinds of um, uh, exercises to create <laughs> the opportunity to discover new things about ourselves that, uh, that that we didn't know are there. I'll give you an example of this. It's a, it's a very poignant example, but it illustrates the point. Um, I have an uncle who, um, you know, was a pretty um, a lovely man and uh, uh, not deeply emotional, uh, but uh, a very nice man, and everything was maybe a little cut and dried for him. Uh, and um, in a tragic ex incident that happened in his young married life, uh, my dear uncle and my dear aunt lost a daughter. And um, this is what uh, life brings to us. We change. And that uncle is the man you want in the hospital room sitting on the bed beside you today when you get bad news delivered to you because he has a strength he didn't even used to have, a strength of being with you, being present, not needing to have answers, uh, showing comfort. It, it's, a, it's a poignant and painful example, but I just don't want us to use the strength survey and then box people up, uh, pigeonhole them. That would be awful. Use it. Use a lot of the instruments, but do it playfully and do it in discovery mode. Experiment and give people room uh, even to change. That's very helpful. So we have a ton of questions that have been coming in from our attendees, and I want to make sure we have time to get to a few. Um, Ken, could you just recap for us the five actions, and please feel free to continue to put questions into the question panel, and I'll, I'll choose from them uh, for the rest of the time that we have together. You bet. On the slide here in front of you that, that looks like a Pentagon, but really is an upside-down pyramid, we started with uh, running to a great purpose, inviting everyone to join the cause upending the pyramid by getting your ego out of the way, running meetings differently, being clear that all the ideas come from all of us, and getting uh, structure put in place so you hear from everyone, getting your ego out of the way to take advantage of the organization, building on strengths but not to an excess, raising the bar of expectations so that you know what's expected of you, and that's a high bar, and then putting yourself to work to make that a self-fulfilling prophecy by blazing the trail of obstacles that stand in the way of those performing and making it possible for them to perform with excellence. Those are the five clusters of actions that all really work together like, uh, like an engine. And the last 10 years of research and observation uh, have done nothing but validate these uh, practices of a serving leader. They typify great leaders and great organizations. 
Thanks. So I'm going to address a question first that came into my email. So you're going to notice I'm trying to read this off my uh, phone screen. This came from Al, who's intrigued about the concept of inverting the pyramid. So as a middle manager, it's something that he tries to do consi consistently, but he, he's working within a hierarchy that tends to be more traditional. So chiefs, directors, managers, supervisors, and staff. So the lower you are, the less influence and autonomy you have. So he's wondering how a middle manager can effectively invert the part of the pyramid that they're responsible for and still live within the traditional pyramid that is unlikely to change over time. Just a couple of comments, Al. Uh, one is, you know, we, we lead up, we lead out, and we lead down. Most great leaders on earth are in the middle somewhere. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think of leaders as the person at the, at the pinnacle, but uh, most of the great leaders are in the pack. They're somewhere in the middle. And uh, I don't know the culture you're in. Uh, I know a lot of really terrific leaders, uh, as, you, um, as you are, who in the middle of an organization work to upend the pyramid, work to serve their people, work to bring their people meaning and purpose, uh, work to set standards so that performance can be terrific, help their people grow and become more while those same things are not being done for them. Uh, I won't name any names, but Ken and I encounter companies like this. And, and what I want to say to you is more of a word of encouragement. Um, you can create great productivity in your space. You can create a, a bubble, uh, a place within your organization that people love to work. Uh, you can create a work environment where results get achieved, and where uh, the word spreads that that's a, that's a division you want to work for. And um, sometimes, Al, uh, you, you get punished for it. And um, uh, I'm sorry to, to have to say that, but sometimes, because, because I know many leaders in your position, the pressure from above is unremitting because the old hierarchy is in place. So you take some hits while you protect your people to do better work. And, um, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're, again, we're not on earth for ourselves. We're on earth for others. And uh, there's a lot of leaders in the middle, Al, who, um, who bear up under a lot of pressure because they aren't supported from above to do what they're doing beneath. But it's worthy work. It's worthy of your leadership and your management to do this work. And you get results. And if you have observant data-driven leaders above you, they're going to notice the data and they're going to like it. Thanks, John. So I have another middle manager question, and maybe, Ken, you can speak to this one. Peter is wondering how a middle manager can ignite a greater purpose in a company that itself has a weak mission or a weak greater purpose. I'm going to try to keep all my remarks really short on these because I, want to, I know we want to get questions in. Uh, the one thing I would do is start with the company's stated mission and vision and values and run an exercise easy to do to say, what does this mean to us? Let's rewrite it for our team. Uh, the second thing, I would point you to a wonderful book uh, called Real Change Leaders, uh, written by the McKinsey team. It has some further reading around this. More advice on this, but I want to keep, I want to keep them short so we can go after a number of the questions. Okay, super. So Denise is wondering how we deal with an unfortunate situation where the company owner isn't of a servant leadership mindset, but everyone else seems to be of that mindset. Um, I know some of these, and um, I think I would lean on the comments I made in the earlier question, Denise. Uh, you know, we're not in control of everything, and, and you did say company owner. And so you bring your best, you bring your A game, uh, you work with excellence. Um, Ken and I have a, a, a mutual friend and mentor uh, here in town, a man named Bruce Spickle, uh, who would say um, in this situation, I'll simply share his counsel with you, uh, focus on excellence uh, in your leadership, uh, not on success. Uh, excellence we're in control of, success we're not. Uh, and so to remember what we can do something about and what we can't, and then make peace with doing the very best we can with the things we actually have control over is very important. Uh, lead well, uh, do your best, uh, contribute, serve that leader. Uh, the fact that that leader uh, maybe is not a serving leader does not mean that you should not serve them well. Uh, do a great job for them. Um, how it turns out in the end is, is, is we say, beyond uh, your pay grade on this, uh, and, um, but trust that your excellence 
uh, will guide uh, uh, will guide you well and um, will serve your company well and will serve you well in this company and beyond. Thanks, John. Uh, Kayla is, is on the line with us. It's uh, technical support. Kayla, I had a request that we go back to the slide that has the five practices on it, if you don't mind. And uh, while I'm doing that, thanks to you, Kayla, for being here today and, and supporting us. Um, okay, so I have a question here from David, um, and he is wondering what type of characteristic you would describe the trust but verify concept. So people say trust but then verify. In some cases, it seems counterproductive. And Dave is interested in hearing your thoughts on that. So I, I would uh, reinterpret uh, the outcome of this in a different way. Um, I believe great serving leaders set goals for performance of the team together. And then you're not you're not depending on some uh, other to verify that we're making progress. Your coworkers know and teammates know if you're giving your best effort every day against the outcomes. And you empower them to give feedback to each other. And then you set incremental hurdle points to say, let's check on how we're doing against our goals together. So it becomes mountain climbing together. Are we making the progress uh, we want to make together? Take away the verify and make it a very encouraging approach to how can I help my teammates perform together. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I wanted to also mention that we are going to share these slides after the event. Uh, there were a few questions that have been coming in, so we will be providing these slides to you. Um, I love this question from Morgan, and I don't know if this Morgan is a he or she, but I'm going to just say she because it's easy. So uh, what about at the beginning of a new formation? Morgan, you can tell me if you're a he or she. What about the beginning of uh, the the new formation of an agency when you're creating the formation team of, of strong values. She is a she. Um, I know who this is. Some, what would be some great first steps um, when you're forming a new agency of really wanting to build a solid foundation of values and um, perspective? So I think maybe you want to answer if you know this person. Hi, Ken. I, I think this is yours, Ken. Oh, is it? Well, I'm going to see Morgan here later this afternoon so she could have asked me in person. Uh, as you have a chance to start afresh, uh, I think you click through each of these five actions. Say, what's our greater purpose and why do we show up to work every day with great energy? How can I serve you? What are the major barriers? What are you afraid of? Let's do a strengths profile so we all get to know each other. And as John said, let's post it. And let's set stretch objectives with regard to serving our customers. And then set to work breaking down those barriers every day. And I'm going to try to get my ego out of the way. Uh, John and I love this, I'm sure mutually as an example. Clint Hurdle uh, describes himself as the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, who've gone from worst to almost first. And he, he practices this every week. He has, if you can imagine this, all these players come in and say, give me tough love feedback on how I'm helping you break through barriers to be a better player. And at first, they were really reluctant to give, the, give him, this is my boss, after all. But after a while, they said, well, Clint, you're not really letting me get enough batting practice. And he'll solve that. You're not really letting me get the defensive signals right because I can't hear. He goes through this throughout the whole season, getting his ego out of the way. And he, he forms a new team every spring. And he goes through the actions of a serving leader. So uh, what better fun than to watch the team that I love? Sorry for you non-Pirates fans. But uh, get to form a team anew every every year and go through these actions. That's fun. Thanks. Um, so I have a couple questions in the panel about introverts and extroverts. And uh, this one came in from Andy, but uh, Gwen also had a question about introverts. So it seems to be that there's a bias in the U.S. that favors extroversion as a key trait of leaders. The serving leader model seems to avoid this trap by looking at behaviors that leaders practice regardless of temperament. Do you think introverted leaders make great servant leaders? I hope so. Uh, being uh, on every scale I've ever taken, uh, over on the the far wall, plastered flat against the uh, uh, the index called introversion, the data is clear that there's a lot of different kinds of personalities that can make a great leader. And yes, there is a bias, um, but I think it's a disappearing bias, frankly. 
uh, that, you know, a certain kind of uh, the great man, the charismatic, uh, the person who walks into the room and, 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 and all the talk stops is a good leader. Uh, I think that bias is disappearing. It's untrue. Uh, and um, it, what we need is a set of skills and disciplines and practices that take some years to develop. You know, leadership is uh, well served by some life uh, and, um, and feedback. And uh, sometimes we have to fall down and pick ourselves back up. We have to learn to pay attention. Think about all, the, all of the things that Ken and I have been talking about over the last 55 minutes and, um, and the kind of paying attention skills that they all require, seeing the other, listening, recognizing uh, more than self. Um, introverts are, um, I think, wired very well to excel. And we know uh, by watching great company leaders that there are fantastic extroverted leaders and there are some fantastic introverted leaders. And, and I promise you, both of those kinds had to do a lot of learning behaviorally and with discipline and with skill sets to become that way. So let's put the introvert extrovert debate behind us. Okay. I, I would comment on this. John and I as a writing team, I'm an outrageous extrovert. And I would oft, I would often ask John, I'd say, what do you think about this, John? And he would say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, John, he'd say, I don't know. I'll know tomorrow. Right. And he would do he would do a depth of thinking that I can only imagine. If you haven't read the book Quiet about the power of introversion, I'd pick it up. So I just wanted to give John a compliment. Um, our, up, our up in the pyramid thing is here on purpose to bring out the thoughts of everyone, even the quiet ones who have the better ideas sitting in the corner. With that story, Ken, all of my colleagues at the Center for Serving Leadership right now, wherever they are, are laughing because the, they've heard that same line for me many, many times. Uh, I know what I think right now, but I'm going to know tomorrow a lot more. I love that. Uh, that's not me. <laughs> that's great, John. That might be maybe the magic in this relationship. I'm going to give a shout out to another book since Ken did. Um, the Genius of Opposites. It's, it's another Barrett Kohler title by Jennifer Conweiler. It's about how introverts and extroverts can lead. Yeah more effectively together. And I think oh. the two of you are a great example of that. Um, I, we're just about out of time. We've had, we have many, many, many more questions. So I'm gonna make the recommendation, Ken, to you and to John that you blog on some of these questions. There okay. are also some questions asking for the resources that you mentioned on today's call. I will put those in my follow-up email. And um, for those of you who asked, we will have a recording. We encourage you to share this recording with anyone in your organization who could benefit from it, of course. Um, and Kayla, if we can go to the final slide, I want to remind everyone that this week we are celebrating the, the launch of this new edition of The Serving Leader. It's been 10 years since the first edition came out. This new ed edition has some additional content. It's a fabulous book. I encourage you to buy it today, buy it in bulk for your organization, buy it for your friends, family, neighbors, everyone you can think of. We will providing uh, we will be providing Ken and John's contact information. I encourage you to connect with them further to find out about the work that they can bring into your organization. I mentioned at the beginning of the call that we are going to have a giveaway of a book. If you will send me an email, Becky at weavinginfluence.com with some relevant helpful feedback for this pair. Um, we will do a drawing and let you know today if you've won a copy of the book that we're giving away today. If not, like I said, go buy it anyway. It's available in every format that you can think of. Did you have something you wanted to say, Ken? No, I just was going to point out what a handsome picture that is of John. Um, <laughs> besides providing research, re I'm wearing my professor hat a little bit too and have started a research project on validating talent management systems on predicting the serving leaders of the future. If there are companies that want to participate in some survey research, we're going to be doing work at General Motors and larger health organizations, but I'd be happy to uh, include you if you'd like to do some fundamental research about predicting great leaders of the future. I'd like to talk to you about It's not a research, it's real work, but uh, that was my invitation. Fantastic, uh, Ken, and you can grab his email address and I'll also include that in our follow-up. Ken and John, thank you so much for investing in this hour with us. I know I have a lot to think about as a leader and I'm grateful to you for pouring into the people who've attended today. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much, Becky, for all your great work. Good have work. Have a great day, everyone. Good to see you, John. Go get them. <laughs>